Good morning and welcome to worship here at Golden Grove Uniting Church. It's good to be with you this morning, the first Sunday of 2024, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone that is with us this morning. Special welcome to any visitors that are joining us this morning. It's good to also have, have you visiting with us. Our call to worship this morning is a Psalm of Solomon. It comes from Psalm 72 verses 1 to 7. 10 to 14 and 18 and 19. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflictive ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May the king of Tarshish of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him, and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy, and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So let's bring praise to God's glory with two worship songs. Let's stand and sing, All Glory Be to Christ, followed by King of Love.
my shepherd is Whose goodness faileth never I'm nothing like if I am his And he is mine forever And he is mine forever come before the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're gathered here this morning to worship, to bring praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of all Lords, to worship Jesus Christ, our King of love. We sing praise to your glorious name for the beauty of creation the expanse and wonders of the universe over which your throne towers. Lord God, Father, Spirit, Son, you lack nothing, and through you everything was created out of love. Father, we want to acknowledge today that we are nothing without you, and that with you we have more than we will ever need. 
Forgive us, Father, when we turn away from you and make earthly things the focus of our lives. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, when we don't show compassion or love others like you have loved us. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, when we close off our hearts to your counsel. Thank you, Lord God, that you promised to never let us go. Thank you that the love you have for us will never change. Thank you for sending your only Son to become the light in this dark world and for revealing him to us. Thank you that by turning away from our sin and by having faith in Jesus, we too share in his atonement for our sin. And as he rose from death, so too will we be raised and live with you for all eternity. What a glorious day that'll be when we see you face to face, Lord Jesus. Amen. God wants us to trust him to rely on him for everything that we need in all facets of our life, to rely solely on his grace and mercy. So let's stand and sing, Come As You Are. Only a couple notices for us this morning, um, all of them in the Gazette, available there at the front of the church or on our church website. And uh, all the January dates there on page three of the Gazette. And just below that, uh, a little article about the theme of our worship service today, the visit of the three wise men uh, to Jesus. Uh, you'd also remember Ted and Heather, who normally play the organ for us. We said goodbye to them uh, last Sunday, and uh, they've sent uh, a thank you card to the church that I'd just like to read out to you. Golden Grove Uniting Church, thank you for the beautiful framed photo of the church and surrounding areas, and also the lovely flowers. The picture has pride of place on our dining room wall. I'm grateful for being able to be part of Golden Grove and its ministry. May the Lord continue to bless the work of the church in Golden Grove and further afield. Heather and Ted McKay. 
Uh, that's all our notices this morning, and we come now to another time of prayer where we specifically pray for the needs of others, for our community, for our world. Um, this morning we'll have an open time of prayer, and uh, feel free to pray out loud or silently as you feel um, prompted by the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to intercede for others. And Lord, while we might not know the specific needs of everyone around us, we know that you are fully aware of what is needed, even before we ask. Your word reassures us that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, interceding for us through wordless groans when we find things so hopeless and overwhelming that we do not know what to pray for, and all we can manage is a simple, Lord, help. We bring our prayers to you now. Lord, we pray that the new year brings love, peace, and prosperity to our community, and that you make your church the center of it all, a light that shines for all to see, bringing glory to your name. Father, we pray for those that do not know you at this time, and for those that in the past have turned their backs toward you. We pray that this new year, the Holy Spirit touches their hearts, and that they hear you calling them back into your love, to a full and more deeper relationship with you. We pray for Jonathan and Catherine, that you keep them safe, refresh them through your spirit during these holidays, give them rest and renew their strength. We pray for those suffering ill health and those that are undergoing medical treatment, that you bless them by ensuring they receive the best care possible and an improvement in their health and quality of life. Lord, strengthen the caregivers, renew their spirits, and show them that with you, there's always hope. We pray all these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue our worship service now with the song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. And while we sing, we'll take up the offering.
pray for the offering. <clears throat> Beloved Father, we thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us and for this opportunity to give a little back to you. Lord, we pray that you accept our offering and that you multiply it, building your kingdom and making use of our church to do so. Amen. Please be seated. Barry will bring us the Bible reading, followed by James with the message. Our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed, bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to the message of God, will you pray with me? Father God, be present with us and surround us with the knowledge of your love. Jesus Christ, word of God, speak your truth through me, so that my words might be not mine but yours. Spirit of God, move our hearts to accept your teaching and be changed, moulded into your new creation. Amen. Here's something you may not know about me. I know a little bit of Italian. A little bit. My first primary school, actually, that I went to from reception till year three, you know how pretty much every school you learn a different language? For that school, it was Italian. Now, I don't remember too much. I remember how to count to 10. I remember a word here or there. And I sort of half remember a couple of little kids' songs in Italian that we were taught to help us remember a few words. Now, I'm not going to try and sing them. You should be very grateful for that. <laughs> but one thing that stayed with me ever since I learned about it back then is an odd little Christmas tradition that the Italians have that's similar in some ways to ours, but also quite different. You see, in Italy, they don't have Santa Claus. You don't see kids go to bed on Christmas Eve and knowing an old man in a red coat is going to come down the chimney and leave Christmas presents in their stockings that they'll wake up to on Christmas morning. Instead, the night that Italian children look forward to is the night of January the 5th. Not Christmas Eve, but Epiphany Eve. Epiphany on January 6th, 12 days after Christmas, is celebrated as the day the 
the Magi, or the wise men, came to see the baby Jesus and present their gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. The Italian tradition is that while the Magi were searching for Jesus, they came across a witch. And when I say a witch, I mean all the cliches involved with that. You know, an old hag in a black shawl riding a boomstick. Her name was La Bufana. But this witch, La Bufana, is kind to the Magi and lets them stay at her house for the night out of the goodness of her heart. They tell her where they're going. They want to find a child born king of the Jews and they encourage her to join them. But Labafana says no, she's not interested. The next day, though, after the Magi leave, she has a change of heart. She decides she wants to see Jesus after all. So she sets out on a boomstick and goes looking. But she doesn't know where Jesus is. She doesn't know where the Magi went. The story goes that even to this day, Labafana is still somewhere out there, flying around on her broomstick looking for Jesus. But once every year on January the 5th, during the night, she visits every home where there's a child and leaves gifts for them, out of the belief that the Christ child lives in all children. Now, it's just a story, obviously. But it's interesting, isn't it? In Italy, which we must remember was the centre of Christianity for centuries, their main Christmas tradition for kids revolves around a witch. And usually, in kids' stories, the ugly, cackling witch is the villain, right? The bad guy to the kids who somehow have to outwit this witch, otherwise she'll eat them for supper. And that's not even getting to the fact that witchcraft is expressly forbidden in the Bible and has always been against the teachings of the church. So why is this witch celebrated? And while we're thinking about that, we could ask the same question about the Magi too. It's not quite as obvious, especially given the word in the Bible is often just translated as wise men or even kings, But these were not people who you would expect to come and worship Jesus or even show the slightest amount of interest in him. The Greek word, the singular is magus, actually typically refers to people who practice other religions, such as Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of the Persians, which relied a lot on reading the stars, like horoscopes today. Or in the book of Acts, the same word is translated as magician or sorcerer and used to describe a couple of pretty no-good characters there. So it isn't really a positive thing that these are called magi. And a very obvious thing we can see is that these magi, they weren't Jews. They'd come from lands in the east, a different country, They didn't even know Jewish teachings or scriptures. They had to ask where the child was supposed to be, whereas any devout Jew who knew the prophecies would have been able to tell them that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. So it's the same question, isn't it, as we had with Labifana. Why would these people, who seem so unlike what we would expect as a worshipper of Jesus, why do we celebrate them? And the answer is staring us in the faith, isn't it? It's because, despite all appearances, they were faithful. They followed the star, they sought out Jesus, they worshipped him. Labafana, the witch, according to the legend, she looked for Jesus too. She never found him, but she still looks sincerely and never gives up. It's this seeking of Jesus, that's what changes everything. It's the difference between the faithful and the unfaithful, the believer and the sceptic. Are you seeking him? We live in a society today, 2,000 years on from then, in a land far off where Jesus was born, which makes it both easier and harder to seek him. Easier because we have the Bible, we have the church, 
we have the Holy Spirit. We have the knowledge of what God has already done for us and for all the world through Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, we have the obvious physical problem that we can't just go out and find Jesus ourselves. We're in a different place and time. We can't go and walk somewhere the way that Magi did. And we're also just so far removed from there and then. We've got busy lives, we've got lots of distractions and in our society today there's little or no value placed on faith. So I think we can learn a lot from this story of the Magi of what it means to seek Jesus despite whatever obstacles or struggles we might come across. I'm going to draw out three particular elements of the story that were absolutely necessary for the Magi and for us to seek him out. They are the revelation, the reason and the response. Three R's there, so hopefully it's easy to remember. Revelation, reason, response. Firstly, the Magi absolutely 100% needed a revelation from God. And that had to be the first thing, the first step, otherwise their journey never would have started. They didn't just pack up and head out of their land to some foreign land in the West on a whim, did they? No, they came because it had been revealed to them that something special was happening. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews, they asked. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Revelations from God, they can happen in a lot of ways, instant or gradual, natural or miraculous. For me, the reality of Jesus became clear only over time through the actions of my parents, my church, Christians around me, nature in general, and God's work in me. It just became clear to me that God was not only real, but living and acting in the world through Jesus Christ. If you're here and you're a believer, then you have your own story of God's revelation to you. Sometimes it is more dramatic, more supernatural, We don't tend to expect it in our materialistic Western society, but it does happen. There is an extraordinary number of converts from the Muslim faith to Christianity who say that the way they met Jesus was in a dream and it changed their life. And of course, we have the Magi who, like I said earlier, they followed the stars. And so God sent them a sign that was in their language. They could understand it a special star that signalled and located Jesus' birth. So God reveals Jesus in different ways to different people, but he is always the one doing the revealing. And that revelation always comes first, before we have done anything. In order for us to seek him, he first must seek us. He seeks us. That's revelation. Now, the second point, the reason. It is possible to look for Jesus for all the wrong reasons. We see that in this passage, don't we? The Magi were not the only people trying to find Jesus. Herod was too. And on the surface, he seemed just as earnest and committed as the Magi were. He took their words seriously. He dug up the prophecies and found out where the Christ would be born. He did his best to locate the exact time and place and said that he too wanted to worship the child. But obviously, he wasn't honest about it, was he? His actual motivation, rather than love and devotion, was fear and selfishness. He saw this newborn king as a threat to his own power and wanted him gone. As we see later on in Matthew chapter 2, and I'm sure we all know the story, he uses the time the Magi told him to figure out how old the boy must be. And then 
he orders all the boys in Bethlehem up to that age to be killed. Now, obviously, not too many people these days look for Jesus with that kind of intention. But it still is important to seek him with a heart to find him and worship him, as the Magi did. And that's not to say God can't use people who started with the worst of intentions. He can. The story of Paul in the book of Acts is a great example of that. But there are many examples of people perhaps in some cases people we know, who have approached Christianity or even seemed for a while to have a faith, but the foundation was all wrong and they fall away. Like people who become a Christian because it's what their friends are doing or because it's the cool thing to do or because they want God to do something for them, like give them lots of money and a good life. It doesn't exactly work that way, right? (laughs) and there are times in the Bible where coming to God on false pretenses can have some pretty terrible consequences if you want to do some extra Bible reading you might look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 no matter what it specifically looks like the reality is if we have selfish motives for seeking Jesus then that sets us up for a fall As in Jesus' story about the wise and foolish builders, if the foundation isn't on the rock, a storm's going to destroy everything. But if we seek Jesus with a genuine heart, if we want to know him and worship him for his own sake, that's when we have a foundation that won't fail us. And it then comes out through our actions. Which leads into the third The third R, there's a revelation, the reason, but there also has to be a response. The Magi did not simply find Jesus, satisfy their curiosity and walk away. They were overjoyed and they worshipped him. Again, bear in mind that these were probably adherents of a different religion non-Jews who didn't know the Jewish law, didn't understand what this baby king was going to do. They certainly didn't know he would die for their sins. But they knew that he was God and and worthy of worship and that this was a good thing, something to get excited about. And they offered gifts too of gold, incense and myrrh and we could go into the the symbolism of those three things but that's a whole other ceremony in itself. But the point was they made material sacrifices. They gave of themselves. They didn't have to, but they chose to, to offer what they had for his glory. And notice verse 12 too, that having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Why did God warn them? We could easily just say, oh, that makes sense. God did that to protect Jesus Joseph and Mary, but it didn't actually end up helping much. Herod just had all the Bethlehemite boys killed and the family had to flee to Egypt to escape. Now, what this was, is it, it was actually a test for the Magi. Herod had told them to report back to him. God was saying something different, so who were they going to trust? Who were they going to obey? the Jewish king who they'd gone to in the first place for advice on finding Jesus? Or would they do what God was telling them? And as we see, they obeyed God. They avoided Herod and went back home a different way. So joy, worship, personal sacrifices, obedience, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Quite a lot to cram into just a few sentences. The Magi had to have the revelation from God and the right reason to seek Jesus. Without those, nothing would have happened. But they had both of those things and the result was this very visible response. The response on its own doesn't do anything. You can do a lot of good things and yet have your heart be far away from God. But when we have had that revelation from God and are seeking Jesus with our whole hearts and we find him, 
well, it's only right that we should be filled with wonder and awe, isn't it? It's only right that we should worship and give all glory and honour to him. That's the right response to Jesus. So, the Magi got a revelation from God. They set out to find the King of the Jews with the right reason to worship him. And when they found him, they responded with love and obedience. Now, do you notice what did not happen in that passage? The Magi didn't convert to Judaism and start going to synagogue. They didn't stay in Judea and become disciples of Jesus once he grew up. They didn't even change their religion or repent of their sin, or at least there isn't any indication they did. In other words, they didn't do any of the right things that we would expect to see of people who are becoming a Christian. Nothing except worship Jesus and bring gifts to him. I wonder if that shouldn't challenge us a bit when it comes to our perception both of ourselves and of others, those who already believe and those who we hope to see come to faith. Now, don't mistake me. Addressing sin and repentance is hugely important. It's vital. It's a required step if anyone wants to move past the stage of just liking Jesus to fully giving over our lives to him. But in the end, no one can ever be argued or shamed into worshipping Jesus. It has to be the revelation of God. It has to be the reason for seeking. It has to be a response. But as challenging as that might be, it's also incredibly good news. What it means is that God doesn't turn people away for their mess, their sins, and tell them to clean up their house first before they can approach him. He wants people, he wants you and me to give him our hearts first. Come as you are, that's how I want you. The rest will be sorted out later. We remember and honour the Magi because they did this. They sought Jesus humbly and worshipped him. Even now, here and across the world, wise men and women are still seeking him. Are you seeking him? Has God revealed Jesus to you? How do you think he might do that? What's your reason for seeking him? Why are you here today or listening today? If you're not seeking, why not? And if you have found Jesus, what's your response? How is he changing your life? As we remember the Magi persistently searching for the Christ and rejoicing over him, my prayer is that our own hearts and minds will be as wise as theirs, so that we too may seek and worship the living Christ all our days. Amen. Now, for the most part, we are past the season for Christmas carols, but this one in particular we can get away with for today, given the subject is the Magi and their desire to worship Jesus. So let's join with their worship and sing We Three Kings.
Kerry's going to lead communion for us. The service this morning will be a bit different than normal because this is the uh, way we do it at Estia, and I'm there every other month. So it's a lot easier for me to do what's here than to try and do something that's much more complex. The Confession. Merciful Father, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for our sins. Father, forgive us, strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Declaration of Forgiveness. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He were God's words of grace to all who believe in him. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Hear the words of the institution. Our Lord, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup and after supper and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it all of you. This is my blood of the new, new covenant which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we remember the sacrifice of our Lord as we receive his body and blood with this bread and wine. We rejoice to receive all that he has done for us in his life and death, his resurrection and ascension, and we wait for the coming again to share with us the heavenly feast. Grant us your Holy Spirit that, may we, re that we may receive the body and blood of Christ. We may be filled with your grace and heavenly blessing, obtain forgiveness for our sins, peace with you, and lasting joy and comfort. Lord, come to us to cleanse us. Lord, come to us to heal us. Lord, come to us to strengthen us. And grant, Father, as we receive the blessed sacraments of the body and blood of Christ, we may come to that holy mystery with faith, love, and true repentance, that being filled with your grace and heavenly blessing, we may obtain forgiveness of our sins, peace with you, and lasting joy and comfort. We ask this because you lived and died and rose again as the Saviour of all. Amen. Would they come forward, please? The bread we break is the sharing of the body in Christ. We we'll distribute the bread.
the bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Please eat. Take it on, please. Serve it. The cup we take is a sharing on the blood of Christ. Please drink. Yeah. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, has graciously come to us in this holy feast. Thank you for making us sure of your love and forgiveness by giving us his body and blood to eat and drink with bread and wine. By this gift, make our faith strong. Help us to serve and follow you truly and bring us to be with you in your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them their trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. You can stand for the benediction. And just a reminder that we've got tea and coffee and biscuits in the back hall, so if you've got a bit of time after the service, do stay for a chat. It's always great fun. There's no cafe church this week. That won't be staying back for another three weeks, just taking a bit of a break, but we'll be back. And if anyone here would like prayer for healing or for any other need, stick around the chapel after the service and someone will be happy to pray for you. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And our final song is Now Unto Him.